Okay, everyone, I've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to go ahead and get rolling. Um, but please do feel free to stop me at any point with questions as we go through. Um, yeah, I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. So my talk is decolonizing water, and I'm going to break that apart a little bit. Uh, so, colonize, what does that mean? In its root sense, it means to establish control over. And so what is the colonization of a watershed? And how much of our areas are colonized? And if you don't have to look far, you can look outside anywhere around this building and you can see how we've tried to establish control over water for our own benefit. I drove from Montana to here entirely on surfaces that allow no infiltration of groundwater. Every square inch of surface that I traveled across is the colonization of the watershed. This map shows you how much of the world has been colonized. So you can see there's not many places in the world that have never been colonized, and they're mostly tied to extreme deserts, extreme climates. Um, but so let's look at some of these effects of colonization. Well, we can look at the cradle of civilization, the Levant, the Fertile Crescent, the birthplace of agriculture. About 10 to 12,000 years ago, humans invented the plow and domesticated animals. And this was really the first time that humans had the ability to control the watershed and manipulate it for their own gains, for short-term gains. And so over not too long, this valley went from the most fertile place in the world, one of the most fertile river basins in the, on the planet, to the desert it is today. And this is from humans seeking to control nature colonizing the watershed. You can go all through time and find different people talking about it. I like what Plato said over 2,000 years ago. He's talking about Greece and how it used to be in the past and how it is today. The land was the best in the world. There were remaining only the bones of the wasted body. All of the richer and softer parts of the soil having fallen away and the mere skeleton of the land being left. In the primitive state of the country, its mountains were high hills, covered with soil, and the plains were full of rich earth. There was an abundance of wood in the mountains. Of this last, the traces still remain, for although some of the mountains now only afford sustenance to bees. The land reaped the benefit of the annual rainfall, not as now losing the water which flows off the bare earth into the sea, but having an abundant supply in all places, providing everywhere abundant fountains and rivers. Such was the natural state of the country, which was cultivated by lovers of honor and of a noble nature, and had a soil the best in the world, and an abundance of water, and in the heaven above, an excellently tempered climate. And throughout this, I'm going to start to draw those analogies and how our colonization of the water cycle is actually leading to the climate extremes. We now no longer have an excellently tempered climate with soft, balanced, seasonal, consistent rains, we now have these extreme surges followed by extreme drought. And so, what is the extent of colonization of the watershed? Well, it started here in the Middle East, 10 to 12,000 years ago, and then as they started to degrade that place, these technologies slowly moved to other areas. First into Northern Africa, six to 8,000 years ago, then around 6,000 years ago to the Tibetan Plateau. Now that example is really interesting because the Tibetan Plateau was a place contiguously inhabited by humans for 20,000 years without a large shift in the climate. But when these two technologies came in very short order, the monsoon seasons totally changed and now trees that used to be quite prevalent in that area more than 6,000 years ago can't even survive there. And so through these two tools, this has really spread around the earth, desertifying over the last 10,000 years, one third of all of Earth's land. But that's not even the biggest problem we face now. We actually face a bigger challenge in urban development and the vast creation of hardscapes, the vast draining of valleys. This is Bogota, Colombia, but it could be any place in the world. When it rains here, the streets fill with water. It rains so hard, but everything you see in this picture is designed to drain the water away as quickly as possible. All of the infrastructure, underground tubing, and not just that, but all of these hardscapes designed to drain that water away. This city, like most cities in the world, is actually in the bottom of a valley. And so all of the mountains, all the rivers, all the streams, the forests, all feed their water into the bottom of this valley where it is rapidly drained. And so this is the colonization of the water cycle. What else is? 
these horrific places you see, like mines, where we're really manipulating water and earth for our own immediate gains. There's a mine in Montana that's rising with water from the ground, and it's the pH of stomach acid. When geese land in it, they die. And so now they shoot fireworks and haze them with drones to try and keep geese from landing in it. Now, this water is filling up, and starting next year, actually, it starts spilling over into Silver Bow Creek, all the way into the Columbia River and into the ocean. And their remediation plan is to essentially load it with lime so that all the heavy metals aren't as reactive, create this huge dead zone from basically Butte to Missoula, and then hope that most of the toxins have dropped down in the water by that point. And so we're really creating massive change. This is the place that I come from, the Gallatin Valley. This was known as a sacred valley. It was a valley that almost all the tribes in the West claimed because it was two-thirds wetlands. The whole valley was wetlands. And all of these medicines and flowers grew there. They grew nowhere else. And so this was a place where there was to be no war. You left your arms at the entrance of the valley, and it was a sacred valley known as the Valley of Flowers. Now, they've systematically drained it to where it's le much less than one-third wetland. From two-thirds wetland to the whole valley to less than one-third, and what has it been drained for? It's been drained for agriculture. This is where our arable land comes from, from draining wetlands, and then for development as well. And they've done a lot of each in this valley. And if you look at Turtle Island here, the extent of the colonization of the water cycle is extreme and severe. From examples like that mine I mentioned and the Valley of Flowers, throughout the whole Midwest, all of those farms you see, they're all drain tiled. So what this means is they've laid pipes in underground to drain the water away. It causes eutrophication, nitrification in water bodies downstream. And why is this done? It's done because in the past, rains were consistent. They wanted to get their crop in earlier, so they tried to drain off all the spring moisture so they can get through with their equipment, get their, get their crops in, and then hope it rains, pray for rain. And so this, the extent of this is all over the place. You can look at California. California is probably about 10 years away from being in Syria. They're degrading the water cycle so rapidly. The aquifers are draining so quickly, and now what's happening is as the wells dry up, the big companies, the big farms just put in deeper wells. The small farmers can't afford to drill that deep anymore, so they have to sell off to the big farmers, and so the cycle is just getting worse. Worse and worse. And not only that, but this is actually blocking moisture from feeding into the mountain west. So all of those heat bodies all along California are actually preventing a lot of the moisture that we used to receive throughout the whole mountain west from even entering into the continent. And so what are the results of something like this? Well, a big one is flooding. When you take all that water, you expose all that earth, you try and discharge it as quickly as possible, the logical result is flooding. Then you have these severe droughts that follow the floods because all of the spring moisture that used to infiltrate into the ground has been shed away, and so you end up with these horrific droughts. In the worst scenarios, this leads to fire as well, and is really severe, loss of human life, of habitat, of property, of ecosystems. And all of these things lead to refugee crises. They lead to people leaving the place where they are from, where they live, because there's no water. And this is why when I say California is maybe 10 years away from being Syria, at some point in the foreseeable future, there will be watershed total collapse in California, agricultural collapse, and then all of those people are going to be headed somewhere. Uh, and then you get these horrific cases of starvation. There's enough on the planet for everyone, but it's from our desire to control water that we're creating. There are no natural disasters. All of these disasters are the direct result of human management. And so this is what I call the half-water cycle, Victor Schauberger's half-water cycle. One of the biggest things going on here is the temperature of the soil. The temperature of the soil has a big impact with how it can absorb the falling rain. And so when you have these areas that are cleared, all of these bare lands from agricultural fields that are much more exposed than the forest that used to be there, or the perennial grasslands, to bad forestry practices, where we plant a plantation of one species, cut it down all at the time, same time, 
And so what happens, all of that water that used to infiltrate now just runs quickly downstream, leading to that flooding and erosion and eutrophication of the water bodies, followed by drought, followed by fire. And so humans in their infinite wisdom, now we drill into the deep water, sucking that dry, and just increasing the rate and intensity of desertification. Now, the climate impacts of something like this, you have all of these columns of hot air rising off the bare earth, pre preventing that moisture from even entering. And so what happens is as the high pressure hot air pushes against the lower pressure humidity, the pressure builds. Eventually it comes over that wall, and like in hurricanes like Harvey in Houston, you just get this elevator pump where it just moves water from the ocean. So you get these huge, horrific, catastrophic, dangerous storms with drought and fire in between. So this is, that's the story of the colonized watershed. And I want to summarize this with, uh, this is a quote from uh, two musicians called A Tribe Called Red. Uh, the human beings, the people, this is talking about the original state, see the spiritual and the natural through sense and feeling. Everything is related. All of the things of the earth and in the sky has spirit. Everything is sacred. Now this is talking about colonization. Confronted by an alien nation, the subjects and the citizens see the material religions through trauma and numb. Nothing is related. All of the things of the earth and in the sky have energy to be exploited. Even themselves, mining their spirits into souls sold, until nothing is sacred, not even their self. This is the world we're living in, but it doesn't need to be. We can very quickly move back to this previous state if we choose to. The earth literally is in our hands. It's our choice whether we want to live in these extremes of fire, flood, and drought, or whether we want to live in a nice, balanced, comfortable, vibrant, vital world. And so what does the decolonization of the water cycle look like? What does that even, what does that mean? Well, the first step is in our relationship with nature, in our relationship with water. And so these are three things that I think are very important in building this relationship. Water is one of our relatives, and we have to work for it. Just like you work for your child, for your partner, for your parents, we have to work for water as well. And so one of the biggest things, if you leave here with nothing other than this one thing, I want it to be that every day you spend some time with water. This can be a creek or a river nearby, it can be the water coming off the roof of the house, it can be the water that you're using to shower in the morning. Whatever you like, but spend some time with it. Let your mind go quiet and open your awareness, open your empathy, open your feeling, and let the water tell you what it's going to. And we can learn all the solutions to all the world's problems if we just take the time to listen to the brilliance of nature. Nature has for all questions an answer. It's just a matter of if we're listening or not. So the next step is to really develop your mind. It's so easy to get wrapped up in academia, and I really think that theory cripples. This is something my mentor says all the time. He calls people theory cripples for the academics, for the different people, because we're never going to know anything, everything. We're only going to know pieces, and you don't need to know everything to operate within this world. You need to have faith that natural processes happen and work. And we really, sometimes the less you understand, the better it is. Some of the most beautiful examples I've seen, greenhouses, ecosystem greenhouses using perpetual soils, and I explained to the person who created it what the concept of an ecosystem was. He didn't even have that in his mind, but he created an example that's more effective and productive in the biodome in Arizona, or Biosphere 2.0, whatever they call it. Um, so then another piece is to forethink, to think ahead, to have dynamic and adaptive thinking. Think about what the results of your actions are going to be. Think about the resources that are going to come. Think about the rains. When that happens, where is that water going? Where is it leaving? Where could it be stored? And then landscape literacy. It's so easy for us to look at highly degraded states and think they're natural. Look at our national forests, for example. Most of them have been logged several times. Many of them have been replanted as plantations, but because that's what we know is natural, that's what we think is natural. But it's not actually natural. And a great way to improve your landscape literacy, 
As you're driving, look at the roads. Look at the impacts that the roads have. Look at the valleys that the roads are draining. And you can very quickly start to see how the landscape used to be different. You can see all these cuts through the landscapes humans have made, ditches, drains, all of these different pieces. And you can start to imagine, what was that like before this valley had a culvert at the bottom of it, had the sides cut out, and was designed to drain as quickly as possible? What did it look like? Was it a wetland? Was it a seasonal water body, a vernal pool? Really get your minds thinking and don't take anything for granted. Don't think that the place that you're looking at was not, not disturbed. I've been to, I've literally been standing in the middle of a quarry with somebody who said, well, this area is just so natural, I don't want to do anything with it. <laughs> and it was because trees had regrown, the quarry was 20 years old and it hadn't been mined. And so some small trees, but literally they thought that was the natural state, looking into a quarry of marble. <laughs> and that's how, that's how low our landscape literacy really is. Um, now the big piece, I think this is honestly the biggest piece in manifesting your world, in decolonizing the water cycle. Civil courage is really important. We live in a world where everything that's right is illegal and everything that's wrong is what's supported by the government. And so we as the people need to have the civil courage to start breaking the laws to change the laws. Sepp says all the time, my mentor, nature is my lawyer. I don't listen to the laws of man, I listen to the laws of nature. And until people start doing that, we're not gonna make any forward momentum. All of the people that are creating the damage, they don't abide by all the rules, they just do it. And if we abide by the rules, we're setting ourselves back. And you can look at different places. Sepp Holzer is one of the most fine farmers in Europe. He's created this ecological oasis that feeds life, that feeds nature, that's a productive, ecologically, economically viable farm, but he's been fined by the government again and again for creating terraces, for creating water bodies, for planting fruit trees, all these different things. Rahendra Singh, a man who's brought water back to 250,000 wells, restored seven rivers, he had 35 different legal cases against him from the government. We really need to have this civil courage to move forward. Now, freedom from attachment. That's a hard one, but a lot of times in this manifestation process, if you get so tied up into what you think you're creating, you actually missed the creation. You missed what you set in motion. And so it's important with any natural system to be dynamic, to be flexible, to understand that you're trying to create something, but it might not come out how you imagine, and that's not a problem. We need to adapt to what happens. And relentlessness is a really important piece. Just dogged persistence, really, that's, what's, that's what it's gonna take to decolonize the watershed. We're in this state where it's so broken, we're so far down the watershed death spiral that it's gonna take a lot of tireless work to get us back out of it. And so this man, my ultimate hero, Seth, my teacher, he's gone around the world creating these movements where they brought water back to landscapes. This man, Rahendra, who I've just met, he started a movement that's affected over a million people, bringing water, bringing life through this whole giant regions of India. Both of these men are bad men by the government standards. They both have a lot of persecution against them, and that's what it's going to take to move things forward. So, I'm going to bring this up again, the decolonization of water. What does it look like? Well, one of the first things is to make the rains that we receive to receive the benefit from those. And that's to make the water move more slowly through the landscape. Decentralized water retention landscape, where we store those seasonal surges of water. This is flood mitigation and drought mitigation. But it's important to note these ponds aren't keeping the water separate from the earth, they're returning the water to the earth. It's only watertight on the sides that the dams are built. These areas are not watertight, allowing that water to discharge back into the earth, restoring springs, rehydrating aquifers, but just as important, making a humid biome around the water features that can be cultivated. So let me show you a little bit of some of the transformations possible. This is a project in Montana. After two weeks' work, this is what we created. Very short amount of time. Now, here, the previous owner had put a land, an airstrip through the wetland, because they wanted to be able to land their planes, so they just trucked in a bunch of gravel, 
And so this was this highly degraded wetland that some people might have looked at and thought was natural. And this is what we created there. A two and a half acre pond, a series of connected water bodies, a kilometer of fugu culture. And now you can go to this place at any time of year and find tracks from every type of wildlife in Montana. It's from this heavily degraded wetland to an ecological oasis in <coughs> two weeks and then letting nature's processes unfold. Now this is another example of Portugal. This is a place that receives no precipitation for 11 months out of the year and then heavy rains for that other month. This is a community of about 200 people who came to Seth Walter and said, can we survive here? They were on a deep borehole well that barely produced enough water for the community, didn't produce enough for any agriculture or irrigation, and this is what they created there. Now this is only with the water from the sky, only the rain that nature gifts to us, and only with natural materials from the earth. We're reorganizing the earthen resources to store those seasonal rains, and now this community is on shallow wells, recharged by their own water retention landscape. An interesting story downstream from this, the neighbors were all up in arms when they were trying to create this. They said, no, no, no. They called the police. They did everything that they could to stop them. They got the work through anyway, and now the neighbors love it. Because instead of one month of flooding from above and 11 months of no water, they now have consistent year-round springs fed by this water retention landscape. So it's not just for these properties that this work is done, it benefits the people downstream, it benefits the people upstream, it benefits the wildlife. This is really for the global commons that we're doing this work. So that water must, that water level must vary a lot seasonally. Yes. It completely dry out sometimes? It's no, since they put it in, it's never dried out. It took three years to fill um, because they received very little rain. They have a some years they'll receive 20 inches, some years they'll receive five. Um, and so the first two years after they built it were drought years where they received very little. Then it filled up and it will, it will ebb and flow about three to five feet, depending on the rains that year, the temperatures that year. So it does ebb and flow, but it's also part of a network where they have other water bodies upstream here. And so they're able to move the water around and keep some of the water bodies full and then have other ones that are a little bit more sacrificial you might say or more functional use for irrigation for and now this community is growing their own food they have more water than they need and they're really a beautiful example of what's possible and so i'm really focused on having boots on the ground all of these ideas and concepts are great but we have to actually do something for something to change. Do something and then something happens. So these are some of my projects. This is an area, it looks lush and green now, but later on in the summer it would just be brown and dead. All, and you see all these hard surfaces here, causing all this water that used to feed into this area to just run quickly downhill. And so what we did here is created a crater garden. And so what this does is it stores the moisture off of the roof and off of the driveway collects it into a water body down at the bottom here. But what this also does is creates a microclimate. And so it's a sheltered basin where the wind can't strip away the humidity. It can't strip away the temperature. And so you have a warm, humid microclimate. For plants, absolute temperatures are not as stressful as the rate of change. And so something like this really helps buffer that. If you walk from up here in the summer, down into the crater garden, you can actually smell and feel the humidity difference because that water is evaporating into that area and so that buffers the temperature. So at night when it cools down, it cools down much more slowly into even a slightly higher temperature in the crater garden versus outside. Um, using these same techniques, we were able to grow things that wouldn't normally grow in, in the climates that we're working in. Um, and really amazing, as soon as you bring the water back, Life just like that. I mean, I don't know where these oarsmen and water skippers and dragonflies, you can put a pond in where there's no water body anywhere close, and like the day you build it, the dragonflies are there. And so life <laughs> is just so ready to happen as long as we give it what it needs to start. So this is one example of a, a relatively small example of what someone can do in their own home, in their own backyard, to help be part of this decolonization. Here's another example. This is the family's first garden. 
And I really loved it because they never had a garden before, so they didn't have expectations of what it should look like and how it should be manicured. And so we set them up with this very diverse garden where there's lots of different species here working in cooperation with each other. There's deep-rooted species like the sunflowers drilling into the deep moisture, pulling up that moisture, making it available for the more shallow-rooted things like the lettuces that are cycling the organic matter and the nutrients more quickly, depositing those uh, metabolites on the leaves, washing back into the soil, and feeding the sunflower. And so they thought, why doesn't everyone garden like this? All they did is throw out some seeds and harvest, essentially, <laughs> and it's because they're working with the natural diversity. And when you have that natural diversity, a lot of magical things start happening. They're starting to really study quorum sensi, where once you reach a certain point of diversity, it's, it really is like magic. So they've done these different studies. For example, one in North Dakota, they planted different plots of two, one, two, four, 12, and 20 different species. After they started this trial, there was no rains. They thought the whole thing was going to be a failure. It was a horrific drought year. What they found, the mixes of one, two, four species, total crop failure, brown, nothing. The mixes of 12 and 20 different species produced a tremendous amount of biomass. And so what they're finding is that the bacteria in the soil, because of the way they're producing RNA, they actually have the ability to turn on and off different epigenetics within the plants. And so once you reach a certain point of diversity, where you have enough different types of bacteria in the soil, they can actually trigger genes for drought resistance, for these different situations that the plants might need. Another example of this in Germany, they did mixes of four, eight, no, sorry, two, four, eight, and 12 different species in plots right next to each other and applied different rates of fertilizer. They found that the plots with eight and 12 species with no fertilizer outproduced the mixes of up to four species with 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So less diversity with a ton of fertilizer still didn't match with the more diverse system. So this is a really important piece of the water cycle, the plant diversity with, that we cultivate. So here's another example, a natural swimming pool. And so if you think all of the pools that are out there filled with this toxic water that for one, is causing issues for the humans swimming in it, but two, is causing a lot of wildlife loss. Every day there's dead things in those pools. Now, if we can start to use natural processes to clean the water, to create clean water to swim in, where we're using the oxygenated zone, we're using the bacteria to filter and clean the water, we're using the plants to comb nitrates and phosphates out of the water, we have a deep zone with charged water, now this becomes a habitat feature. Now all the songbirds have a place to drink, all the wildlife has a place to drink, and it's a healthier body to swim in. And so there are different ways you can convert a current pool to a natural swimming pool, but this is just another simple thing that humans are gonna do anyway, but we could do it in a way that's really beneficial to our surrounding environment and to our relatives. This is another example in Ecuador, a project that we did. Um, this was in a cloud forest, but an area that had been so severely abused it browns out for six months of the year because the heat down there is so severe. So here what we did is we created this network of terraces and water bodies so that when those big surges come, they can really infiltrate into the earth. And so how do we go about creating something like this? Well, the first step is to really look at the geology, to look at the materials and the sediments that you have to work with and to understand what they can be used for. And so what we're always looking to do is find a place to build a keyway dam. So what this is, is we're tying into a natural clay layer that's already there, that's already watertight. So we're hunting for that layer. That's what I'm doing down here in the bottom of the hole. And then we have to find the material to pack into the middle of the dam. That's our nice clay rich material. It has to be at the right moisture and the right level of compaction to hold the water. And we basically make a barrier for the water on just the downhill side. Now, because what's happening, we're just using that natural clay layer, so it doesn't just store the water in the water body itself, it stores the water in the earth all around the water body as well. And so what this means is each inch you lose to evaporation, it's actually being recharged by, the soil, by what's stored in the soil here, 
And many times you're actually storing more water in the earth than in the water body itself with one of these keyway dams. And so this is what it looked like after the first rain once it filled up. Now, another part that I consider part of decolonizing the water cycle is looking at where we're getting our drinking water from. So this is a spring tap. Spring water is really the only water that's drinking water. If you drink rainwater, it's distilled by the sun, but it has no minerals. You'll eventually have problems with different mineral shortages. If you drink well water, this actually doesn't apply for the Northwest because of the types of formation that you have with this very hard basalt. But in most of the world, if you drink well water, it's loaded with way too many minerals. And you'll actually have calcium deposits. You'll have joint trouble later in life, all of these different issues. Now, spring water is the perfect mix. It's water distilled by the sun, but then charged and mineralized by the earth. This is the water that humans have drank forever until we had the technology to do otherwise, and it's really the water that will help heal you. And so how do you do a spring casing? Well, first, you very gently dig out the spring so that you have the running water. You lay in a pipe with slits on the top two thirds, not on the bottom third. Then you fill that with washed round gravel. So what you're doing is you're basically making a little cavity here that allows the water to fill up. You build a little dam there, gravel, cover it back up with clay. And so what this means is you're taking the water out of the earth in those subsoil layers where it's making it available to you, where it's this nice, clean, charged, healthy water. And you're, with as little effort as possible, putting that into a pipe so that it can be used otherwise. Now, with the cap on top of here, you have a very clean, pristine water because an animal could literally come and die right on top of your spring and none of that is going to affect the water quality because none of the rainwater makes it into that spring. It's capped with this clay layer, so you're just harvesting the water out of the earth. So this is, I think, a really important part of decolonizing our minds is to really have access to the water that we should be drinking. This is another example. This is an area where a spring that we actually didn't know there was there at the time had been drain tiled. So the farmer in the past wanted to be able to get through with his tractor or whatever, so he just stuck this spring in a pipe and drained it downstream as quickly as he could. Now this area receives much less <laughs> consistent moisture and they have these long periods of drought and so we wanted to use that spring resource. So what did we do? We created a decentralized water body. So this is that same process where we've dug down to that natural clay layer that's in there and then we're using the clay material to pack the core of the dam so that we can hold that water back. And so this is what that looks like um, now and this is actually quite a nice water body. Gives her plenty of water for all of her different cultivation areas around this. It's created a humid biome around and then you can do some really fun things like with rocks, creating diving boards, and habitat, and all of those things. Now, some other examples of decolonization. This is another water body. This is just fed by the roof of a home. And so this is in the Pacific Northwest, where when it rains, it rains, and rains, and rains. And so we can use and store that water. This is our place where she drilled five wells and hit a gallon and a half a minute on the fifth one. All the other ones were dry. So she didn't have enough water for her animals, and barely enough water for the household uses. And so this water body is storing the excess off of the roof, making it available throughout the year uh, for different uses, whatever she wants. And you can also do these as nice swimming features with docks, stairs, um, to make it so that it's not just a habitat feature, not just a functional water body, but something people can really enjoy and have a good amount of recreation around. This is another example so here you can see it's nicely color-coded for you. So the blue is the nice clay that we were pulling out. And then this material on the sides is the not clay material. And so it, you don't have to create the whole dam with your watertight layer. It's just the center of the dam so that you can really concentrate that. That's what helps hold the water. And you're basically making a giant shock absorber so that when that water moves through the earth, it hits this wall and it has to fill up before it can continue on. And so now that makes that water available to all the rest of life, but also feeding it back into the earth rather than quickly running downstream. So this is a farm that they were developing for their children. This is an old dam that was in that was leaky, but their only source of water. So we put this new dam in so that we'll be able to repair that one. Uh, so that when the level really goes down 
here again, we hit some nice springs that are starting to fill the water body. Um, and it's really important whenever creating a water body that you consider where the water is going to go when there's overflow. And that is a critical part. You want the water leaving on undisturbed grade, on natural ground. It should never cross the dam itself. That's a very dangerous proposition. Uh, and so that's something really important to consider whenever creating water bodies. So this is what that looks like later on once the rains have started. Um, and really, there's this growing movement of people around the world that are so ready to implement these changes. They're just dying to. They want to help the world. They want to live in a beautiful place, but they don't know what to do. And so I find myself called all over the place. Last year, I worked on five different continents. And it's amazing to me that in all these different biomes, they're all experiencing the same problems from the colonization of the water cycle. People are shunting all the water away when it comes and then complaining about the droughts and the fires and the different issues that they have that are really just a result of their own issues. Uh, so this is one of those projects in New Zealand and in just three weeks we got this young family set up with springs tapped, with terraces for cultivation, with a small water body, um, all within a short period of time as they move out and start to homestead their own land. Now this is in that same area. This is uh, a bay in Raglan that used to be one of the most productive fisheries in the world. The indigenous people, the Maori, used to joke that you could walk across the water on a fish there. Now, what happened with all the dairy coming out of New Zealand, the fishery collapsed to the point where there's no commercial fishing happening in this bay anymore. The people were really bothered by this. This is a really ecologically aware community, and so what did they do? They organized amongst themselves a movement of civilians taking civil courage, and in just 10 years, they restored this bay to the point where there's again a commercial fishery. It's not as strong as it used to be, but it's recharging, and it's again viable enough to actually harvest fish out of the bay. How did they do this? Well, most of it was by decolonizing the watershed, by giving areas back to the water. And so in this case, all they really did is they fenced the cattle out of all the riparian areas. This allowed the water to reclaim those areas, those biological filters to restore, and all the sediment that used to be washing out into this bay, causing these algae blooms, causing loss of oxygen, causing the death of the cycle, now are mitigated because they allowed areas to return to the water. Uh, so this is another project in Australia where there was a worm farmer who had incredible demand for his worms, but not enough water to keep growing them, to keep them cool throughout the year. Uh, and so here we created this water body down at the bottom to store that in a network of terraces and leachate ponds so that he has more area to work on this very steep ground. The first rains filled it right up and now, it, I just heard from a little while ago, in one of the worst droughts in New South Wales, he has more water than he needs. And this was, again, this was like a one week project, maybe two, but really you can make a big impact really quickly. Here in Uruguay, a landscape that's scrub and everything spiky and slightly poisonous and uh, a really harsh place, really difficult place, but here too it's possible. And so this, I apologize for the shakiness of the video, but shows you a little bit of the process of building the water body. So taking out the different sediments from here's a spring feeding into this area and then starting to build up our dam here. Um, the spillway comes out this way at the edge on undisturbed grade. And so we're really carefully moving and settling materials through there. Nice rock armoring, any places that get steep so the water isn't causing erosion. And in those rocks and around those live the bacteria that filter and clean the water. So that's another piece of that cycle. Now this one, the water body actually collects the water. They have a nice swimming feature, but they also have water for irrigation for the different parts of the houses up here. But then in addition to that, we actually created a terrace so that the overflow water from this water body works all the way around the landscape and then returns back into the same creek to which it flows. So what we've done is basically where this used to just run 100 feet straight downhill into this deep incised creek that swells seven meters in the rains, now that water moves 2,000 feet more across the landscape before it rejoins with that water feature. And so really just slowing the rate at which water moves through the landscape, 
That's one of the biggest things that we can do to positively impact it. Uh, now, this is another project in Mexico, up high on a mesa. No one lives up here because there's no water. No one can drill a well deep enough. Fires come through every year. But even in this kind of harsh place, it's possible because they get these huge rains when they get them. And so here with the terrace, this was actually continued later on in the project. Terrace through here helps catch all of that water, store it in the water body where nature naturally wanted to keep it anyway. And now, again, this family, they had essentially a year where they received no winter moisture, but there's water in the water bodies and they're the only people on the mesa with water at all in a severe drought year. And so you hear people talk a lot about environmental footprint, and it's always related to reducing our environmental footprint. I want to have the biggest environmental footprint possible <laughs> because I know our footprint can be beneficial. And if we're always focusing on reducing our negative footprint, we're actually never going to get anywhere. We're never going to get to the positive direction. And so when we talk about our environmental footprint, we have to start considering how do we create a positive footprint? How do we create a footprint where flowers bloom as we walk by it? And it is possible. I've seen it in different places. So the decolonization of water, what does that look like? Well, it looks like the restoration of the natural water cycle. So here in the shade of diverse, rich vegetation, vegetation of different ages and different types with roots at different horizons, the soil is kept cool and moist. And so like a moist sponge, when the rains come, it just sucks it all up. It feeds into the earth and it returns as springs, creeks, rivers, keeping the water clear and cool. And then what happens, as the sun evaporates moisture off the ocean, the water vapor drifts inland, this water vapor can't actually condense as clouds and fall as rain without a nuclei to form around. There are three types of nuclei. Salts, which is the geoengineering that they do, but also some of it drives some rain patterns in deserts. Ice crystals, which is orographic lift. This is in the northern, far southern latitudes. And then one of the most important ones is hygroscopic microorganisms. These are microorganisms produced within the stomatal cavities of trees and the underside of the tree leaves, released into the atmosphere and around these microorganisms, it allows that water vapor to condense into a liquid and to fall as rain. Now, as that process happens and water undergoes that phase change from vapor to liquid, it goes from very large to very small. And so it, it creates this void that needs to be refilled by more humidity. And so this is a system called the biotic pump. This is how moisture moves from the oceans through the Earth's continents. The trees are actually seeding the moisture, and then as the moisture is seeded and falls, it actually drives more moisture into the system. And so this is, you look at the Amazon rainforest, for example, actually feeds water through the rest of the continent not just the rainforest itself. If you destroy the rainforest, you destroy the pump, and you destroy the rainfall patterns in the other areas. And so what does the decolonization of the water cycle look like? Well, over the last 10,000 years, all of these brown areas, those are created by humans. Those weren't naturally that way. This whole area was an oasis, the cradle of civilization. It was so good, it was the first place people thought, oh, we should stay here long term. <laughs> And so it looks like this. We can re-green everywhere. I've been to landscapes where it's 120 degrees for three months in the summer, 50 mile an hour blowing winds. You would think there's no possibility to store water in that kind of landscape, but there is, and it's actually very simple. Um, and so we're really talking about rebuilding the Earth's organs. Water is the blood, and the ecosystems are the organs that control the regulation of that fluid. The forests are such a key part. Once we start to understand this, it's all gonna become much easier. Indigenous cultures, it's common knowledge around the world that the forests call rain. Well, Western science thought, oh, these people are just confused. You know, they, The forests grow in regions with high precipitation and that's why they bring the two together. But now as science advances, they're finding out that the forests do call the rain, actually, with these hygroscopic organisms. So in the Amazon rainforest, for example, up to 80% of the precipitation is driven by these microorganisms produced within the forest. So you get rid of all the forests, 
you lose 80% of your precipitation. That's a huge figure. This is how humid deserts are created. That humidity used to precipitate, you take out the ecosystems, you take out the organs, and it no longer can. The soil microlife, the macrolife, is so important as well. The fungi are doing so many different things. They're actually, they're like the immune system for the forest. And so once we start to value and respect the unknown, that's when the decolonization can really begin. So these, for one, they're actually mineralizing rock. Fungi are the organisms responsible for, in these extracellular metabolites, they're actually releasing these acids that break off minerals from the rock, making them available to other things. They distribute nutrients, minerals, they act as the immune system, but then also they're actually producing water. As fungi break down lignin, they're respiring oxygen and they're breaking the carbon and the hydrogen apart, and one of their byproducts is water. If you look at a log, if you look at a fungi, up to, I think, 50% of its weight turns into water as it digests that wood. And so, what does the decolonization look like? Well, it looks like with our forestry practices, instead of taking all those limbs off of the trees, piling them and burning them into the atmosphere, it means lop and scatter. It means chipping. It means letting wood rot so that these natural processes can happen, so that we can feed the fungi, so that we can get more nutrients out of the rocks, and so that they can help safeguard these forests. The rivers and creeks, the open water, this is where life comes to drink on a daily basis, and we really need to start to learn to revere those. There's a movement around the world giving water bodies personhood. There's a movement in the Great Lakes right now to give some of the Great Lakes personhood status. And this is so that corporations can't continue to abuse these elements that are part of the global commons. Mangroves, another important piece. People are always talking about the dead zones in the ocean and the loss of coral reefs. No one talks about how we're destroying the filter. We're destroying the last filter before all that nutrient discharges into the ocean. We think the discharge into the ocean is the problem. The problem is that we're killing the organs. These mangroves are such an important piece. The seagrasses are such an important piece. All of these are vital parts of the body. What happens when you cut off blood to one of your organs? The organ dies. The same thing is happening with the earth. If we cut off the blood, the organ starts dying. So what does the decolonization of the water cycle look like? Well, it looks like turning our public works into public works that's actually working for the public. It means turning the Department of Transportation into the Department of Transportation and Water Retention. This is one thing I think could really catch on quickly. They already have all the equipment, all the land, all the easements. For about a 10% increase in their budget, we could start to look at flood mitigation, drought mitigation, fire mitigation, all as part of the public infrastructure. What does it look like? It looks like a Green New Deal that isn't a technological solution to all of this, that actually models the New Deal. One of the most effective pieces of legislature in the United States, where the United States government said, we're going to band together, we're going to put 10% of the population to work, we're going to create all these decentralized water bodies, terraces, restore forests, they stopped the Dust Bowl, and they ushered in one of the greatest periods of productivity ever. Now, if we model the Green New Deal after the original New Deal, I think we can really get somewhere. If we think we're going to solve these issues with more solar panels, man, we're screwed. <laughs> And so from the tops of the watersheds down to the bottom, we're creating this immense disturbance. Now a really important piece about climate change, global warming, CO2, all of these things that are becoming really big issues, with the Keeling curve, their basic assumption was that our impact on the water cycle is neutral. Now degrading one third of the planet over 10,000 years, I wouldn't call that a neutral impact, but that was the basic assumption that they operated under. Now, one of the basic rules of science is correlation does not prove causation. Do you guys know how much of the global heat dynamics are regulated by carbon? Anyone want to guess? 95. 5%. 4%. Between 4 and 11%. How much is regulated by the water cycle? 75 to 95%. If we're trying to control global temperature, but we're working in that 4 to 11%, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. If we start to store water in the landscape, we naturally bring the organs back to life. We naturally have carbon sequestration. I think that CO2 isn't the problem, it's the symptom. 
And we're so good at focusing on the symptoms instead of the stress that is the problem. And I think that the colonization of the global waters is what's resulting in all of these patterns of extreme climate that we're seeing rise in temperatures. As that water vapor that used to condense and fall as rain, if it doesn't have those nucleates, it forms a warming haze. And if you look at the global warming data, the main increase is in nighttime minimum temperatures. Our daily temperatures aren't that much different, but the lowest temperature we reach at night, that's where most of the warming is happening. And it's because when you create these humid deserts, the heat that used to release into the night sky now has a blanket of moisture keeping it in, creating these humid deserts. Um, and so we really, I think, need to start looking at the whole picture and start looking at the earth as a living being and start to have respect and reverence for it. That's it? Yeah. <laughs>